Well, we are going to get into the Word this morning and uh, cover some ground. Uh, I started last week in talking about uh, a new series that we are covering called Lessons from the Samaritans and learning different keys from the stories and the interactions of Jesus with Samaritans in Scripture. And last week, we uh, covered Luke chapter 10 in dealing with the Good Samaritan, which I always find is ironic because if he says Good Samaritan, the implication then is that all other Samaritans are? <laughs> yeah, well, that's the view that they held of the Samaritans. So in case you weren't here, let me just give you a little bit of review, just a smidge of review. We're talking about dealing with uh, the issue of judgment and offense, which is a weighty and heavy topic, but don't you dare get weighty and heavy on me. You stay with me in a joyous attitude, all right? Can I get an amen? All right, help me out this morning. I need it. Help me out this morning. We're dealing with uh, offense and judgment because I think that one of the keys, not the only key, but one of the keys to going to the next level in our relationship with the Lord is to understand that offense can have no place in us. Offense is a root that leads to judgment. You say, well, what, are you, what are you talking about? I'm saying this. I'm not talking about judging in the sense of making an evaluation I'm talking about judging with a critical, judgmental spirit. Does everybody understand? That's the type of judgment that I am referencing here. You make a judgment call every day. By the grace of God, we all had a shower this morning. Good call. Good call. You evaluated. I need a shower. And you went for it. This is a very good thing. But we're talking about negative or critical motives in your judgment. And we talked last week really about how judgment invites judgment to you. We looked at Matthew chapter 7, verses 1 through 5. They read like this. Do not judge so that you will not be judged. For in the way you judge, you will be judged. That should clear it up. With the measure that you use, it will be measured to you. By the standard of measure, it will be measured to you. Why do you look at the spec? that is in your brother's eye, but do not notice the log that is in your own eye. Or how can you say to your brother, let me take that speck out of your eye, and behold, the log is in your own eye. Sweet and gentle Jesus says, you hypocrite. First, take the log out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. It's not that you weren't in a, could never be in a position to help your brother with the speck. The idea is that you need to judge yourself before you are ever able to be in a position to judge anybody else. Ecclesiastes 7, verse 21 through 22, actually says it like this. Let me read that to you. Also, do not take seriously all the words which are spoken so that you will not hear your servant cursing you. It goes, for you also have realized that you likewise have many times cursed others. What, what, what's he talking about there? It's this. Don't take to heart everything everybody says so that it can take a root of offense inside of you. Number one, why do you assume that they're right? Number two, the whole crux of this is to evaluate yourself before listening to somebody else. How many of you have ever found yourself getting offended at someone who said something that you can recall that you said almost the same thing about somebody else the day before, but when it was said about you, <gasps> how dare they say that? Not even taking into consideration the fact that you did the exact same thing. Have you ever been there? Oh, I've so been there. I've, so, I've been called out on it too. That's grace, by the way, because I wasn't aware that I was doing it. Oh, whoa, I didn't even realize I was doing that. So the grace that was given to me was to be able to see it, recognize it, and deal with it. You are to judge yourself. In other words, take the log out of your own eye because once you judge yourself, you will be dealing 
more than likely after you have dealt with your issues, your capacity to operate in love is at a higher clip, at a higher level, and therefore when you look at the person with the speck in their eye, you are not going to look at them with the same critical motive. You are going to look at them with love. You're going to look through the eyes that Jesus looks through, and you'll be able to actually to minister to them and help them to remove the speck. Makes sense, right? Isn't it amazing? Have you ever, have you ever found you try to step out and do ministry with somebody, but you're dealing with an issue that you're trying to help them with an issue that you yourself have, and in the process of, you end up hurting them? You go, how on earth did that? I thought I was going to help them. No, you need to get that out of you so that you'll be able to help them. Because while you're still dealing with it, your perspective on it isn't necessarily the clearest. Does that make sense? So this is part of the advice that Jesus is giving. He's not being ugly. He's just saying, deal with your junk so that you'll be equipped to deal with the others. And recognize that the junk in you is way bigger than what you're seeing inside of the other people. And that's, don't take that the wrong way. You see a speck, trust me, they've got logs as well. But all you see is the speck. But inside of yourself, you can see all the things that are going on because you know the motivation by which you do everything. Does that make sense? So deal with your log. So we talked about last week, dealing with judgment. And I want to get into this week. For the sake of time, I'm going to skip over some stuff. Uh, know that it was good, and I'll probably never tell it to you again. So, <laughs> okay. <laughs> Let me talk to you uh, about a little bit of history uh, in dealing with Samaritans and offense. Well, you know what? I am going to do it just for fun because I can do it quickly. This isn't Samaritans, but it is offense. People, let me encourage you. Do not just skim over parts of the Bible thinking that they're just like, oh, that's just same old, same old regular. Pay attention to even the things that seem mundane in Scripture because even the mundane words in Scripture have life on them. Don't throw them away thinking, I'll just skip that. When you get to the book of Numbers, read the names. Somebody just repented, I know. <laughs> it was my wife. Okay. She went, oh, come on now. It's awesome. Let me give you an example of this in dealing with offense. Look at Acts chapter 6, verse 1. It says, now at this time... While the disciples were increasing in number, a complaint arose on the part of the Hellenistic Jews against the native Hebrews because their widows were being overlooked in the daily service of food. Typically when we read that and we just keep on trucking on because it's an introductory to beginning of chapter 6, verse 1, and we want to get down to the meat of seeing because we're already skipped on to the choosing of of, uh, deacons and figuring all of that out, I want you to check out in this one little tiny passage of Scripture, this little tiny nugget right here. It says, look, a complaint arose on the part of the Hellenistic Jews against the native Hebrews. And you go, what is that about? To understand the context of this Scripture, you actually have to rewind the clock about 350 years. And you have to go back to a man named Alexander the Great. Does everyone know Alexander the Great? Alexander the Great conquered pretty close to everybody, came close, but then his his army was like, we can't go any further, dude. Let's just go home and chill. You've got enough, which was actually triggering the end of his life. But regardless of, he conquered for, for, he was uh, Macedonian, Greek in that area, and he conquered everything. And this is the process by which Alexander functioned. When he would conquer a people group, He practiced and really pushed out what is called cultural diffusion. Everyone say cultural diffusion. He pushed out cultural diffusion, which is this. Influence every conquered people group with the culture of Greece. Please take note that that was a strategy. That even though later on Rome beat Greece and conquered them physically, Greece still conquered Rome culturally, and it resulted in the falling of Rome. 
does just for free. It's for fun. So Alexander the Great practiced cultural diffusion in influencing every people group that he conquered. And this is a practice that kept on going. When he died, all of the lands got divided between both his heirs and his generals and different people started ruling and breaking off of groups and pretty much wars broke out between everyone trying to figure out who's going to be the top dog in leading and they all kind of had the same spirit of conquest that he had, maybe not the same gifting, but they still wanted to win and they even went against each other. So fast forward the clock to 175 B.C., and you enter into a period of time that is called the Seleucid Empire. And when you're in the Seleucid Empire, there is a man named Antiochus IV Epiphanes that takes over, yes, I know this is fun history time, that takes over leadership in that area, and Antiochus IV kicks up cultural diffusion another level. And so when he goes to the next level of doing it, this is what his goal is. And I quote, to de-Jewish the Jews. That's his goal. And he is trying to, and the word, the term would be this, to Hellenize or to influence Jewish people with Greek culture to the point that their culture disappears and all that's left inside of them is Greek culture. So basically, even though Jewish people are Jewish by identity, culturally, they would, you'd never be able to see the difference between the two. And a lot of Jews bought into this and became what is known as Hellenized Jews. And so you had the Orthodox committed traditional Jews the national Hebrew Jews, and the Hellenistic Jews. And this division started in 100, around, around 100, and, well, in 185, 175 B.C. And a cultural phenomenon happened where a majority went and decided to become Greek in practice to the point that they would actually have surgeries that would try to, like, take away a male's ability to be able to be recognized as a Hebrew, and I'll just leave it there. They, they were that extreme. They were that extreme in what they were doing. And so in 175 B.C., uh, a, a man by the name... Oh, excuse me. Oh, you know what? I didn't even... Mattathias the Hasmonean, say that three times fast. <laughs> Mattathias the Hasmonean was a man that was committed to following after Jesus. Or sorry, not after Jesus, after God. He was devout to the law and would not compromise to go and be a Hellenized Jew. But an edict was given by Antiochus IV to go and force everyone who would not worship the Greek gods to make sacrifices to the Greek gods. And so an official came from Antiochus, showed up on Mattathias' house, and sat there and said, you will worship the god of the Greeks. You will worship the way that we worship, and you will no longer practice your style of worship. And uh, Mattathias said, uh, no. That's not going to happen. And this is what happened. Mattathias sat there, and one of the Hellenistic Jews who was fearful said, oh, forget this guy. I'll go ahead and sacrifice for him. And so he went to make the sacrifice to the Grecian gods, and Mattathias killed him for doing that and then turned around and killed the Greek officer who came to try and enforce him to do that. And this is what is known as the beginning of the Maccabean Revolt. His son, named Judah Maccabee, took over the cause one year later because Mattathias died, and Judas Maccabee raised up and started a commissioned guerrilla warfare against Hellenized Jews because he looked at them as compromisers. You see that? And so, as a compromiser, he is going to start the quest of cleansing the circumstance of the Hellenized Jews. Soon his attention turned 
to Antiochus and his dynasty and the Seleucid dynasty, and this small group of Jewish men were actually able to capture the Temple Mount in Jerusalem and take control of that, driving out the army of the Seleucid king and taking over for about a period of six or seven years. Now, why is that important? Because actually, you know, that's where Hanukkah comes from, from Ju Judah Maccabee and Judas Maccabeus, however you want to say his name. Where, where it started that. But what, what, why am I saying this? What's the importance of this? In this one little tiny passage of Scripture here, where it says, Now at the time the disciples were increasing in number, a complaint arose on the part of the Hellenistic Jews against the native Hebrews. Why? Because their widows were being overlooked in the daily serving of food. Why were they doing that? Because even though they were in Christ, there was a 300 or 175-year-old offense that was seeded into those who had given their lives to Jesus that culturally, they still viewed those who were descendants of the Hellenized Jews as enemies. And so even though they were willing to give them something, they would give it to them after they honored those who were faithful during that time period. Do you see what I'm saying? And this one little passage of Scripture that's one verse long covers a history of 175 years that brings up an understanding of the reason of why they wouldn't look after them or they treated them as if they're second rate is because of a cultural offense that they took up and never broke even though they were in Jesus. Do you get it? And as a result of that judgment... Because listen, this is what happened. Their offense at the inability of the Hellenistic Jews or the, the, the unwillingness of the Hellenistic Jews to be faithful to the law, their choice to not do that brought an offense to the Hebrews that were being faithful and it resulted in them passing judgment on them as if they were second rate. Because offense is a key that leads to judgment. Do you see why it's so very important to deal with offense? And it's not necessarily even, <laughs> I'm sorry, this is too funny. If you are French in this room, forgive me. But I've been known to pick on French people. We surrender. Okay. <laughs> but listen, in all seriousness, I actually had to address it in my heart. Because you don't know, you wouldn't know this, but I'm Canadian. You probably know that. What you don't know is that the Quebec province in Canada tried to separate from Canada through a referendum not once but twice, and it sparked bitterness in my heart where I judged them. And I didn't even realize that the level of joking that I was having towards French people was rooted in an offense where I had passed judgment on them. Do you see this? I had to deal with it in my heart. Because even though it was like funny, which it is, it was inappropriate. And it was rooted in something that needed to go. Do you see that? I believe that the Lord wants to deal with offenses inside of us so that when they are removed, we can operate at a higher level of love, which is what we have been called to do. And that doesn't happen until we actually start to get honest with where we are. Can I get an Amen. Speaking of where we are, let's look at the Samaritan woman at the well. That's all we're going to deal with today. And dealing with offense, and I will try to be quick. John chapter 4. you got to rewind. Uh, I very rarely do I pay attention to chapter breakdowns. Because oftentimes, in order to get the context of where you start at reading a chapter, you actually have to jump back about three or four verses to understand what's actually going on. So we're going to start in John chapter 4, verse 3, going through 6. And it says this. He, being Jesus, left Judea and went away again into Galilee. And he had to pass through Samaria. Now, you may not know the geographical setup of this, but ten northern tribes... Two southern tribes, right? Jerusalem is in the south. Samaria is in the middle of the ten northern tribes, and Galilee is actually more north than Samaria. So for Jesus to go to Galilee, 
he has two choices. He either goes through Samaria or he goes around Samaria. Now, let me show you how the, the level of offense that Jewish people held towards Samaritans, they typically would never be caught walking through Samaria to get to somewhere. They would go around because they looked at Samaria as if they were the scum of the earth. And if you weren't here last week, I don't have time to rehash everything, but just understand there's a 722-year history of where the 10 northern tribes compromised and when they were taken captive by Assyria, and they started to worship God in a way that was not prescribed for us to worship God, and they started worshiping him on this place called Mount Gerizim because they did not have access to Jerusalem to worship God the way that everybody else would because, let's face it, they were in captivity. But when they came back, the southern Jews judged them because they said, hey, you know what? It would have been better for you to not worship at all and wait to worship him rightly than to compromise and worship him on a, on a wrong mountain, Mount Gerizim, than the one that the Lord actually gave us. And so they judged them ferociously and also said, hey, because those that went into captivity, some of them married Gentiles, those that are known as the Samaritans, married Gentiles, and so they compromised, so they were judged for their compromise. They didn't just compromise religiously, they compromised culturally, and they were judged thoroughly for it. And so here we have a picture of where Jesus is about to talk to a woman that is at the well, and Jesus chooses to walk through Samaria. He does not go around. He is a rabbi. He is a notable character that people would recognize on sight, and he chooses to go through Samaria. I can only imagine what his disciples are thinking at this moment. Crazy. I wish I was there. Well, one day I'll get to ask. Remind me. Okay, good. Good. He left Judea and went away again to Galilee, and he had to pass through Samaria. So he came to a city of Samaria called Sychar, or Sychar, near a parcel of the ground, and listen to this, that Jacob gave to his son Joseph, and Jacob's well was there. So Jesus began... Being wearied from his journey, was sitting thus by the well. It was about the sixth hour. There's a ton of stuff in here. Let me break it down really quickly. Number one, I want you to take note of this parallel. Jacob, another name for Jacob is? Well, I'm sorry. That was a misleading question. Israel, right? Because Israel is another name for the ten northern tribes. Ephraim is what they would be called. The ten northern tribes, right? Jacob, Israel gave this parcel of land as an inheritance to his son, Joseph. And what was Joseph known for? Being sold into slavery, going into a different land where he was captive. Are you beginning to see a parallel? And so the inheritance of Jacob's well was being passed from Jacob to Joseph, the one who went into captivity in Egypt, which is representative of the world. All right? The source of water for Israel was being passed. And isn't it interesting that it says that the sixth hour Jesus showed up at this well, the sixth hour in Jewish time would have been high noon when the sun is at its highest level of revelation. Jesus comes on the scene at the right time, people. And so he shows up at the well. The source of living water for all of Israel shows up at the well that was the physical source of water for Israel at the highest point of revelation and is about to talk to a people group that is representative of going into captivity that he still sees as being Jewish seed. And he's about to pass on an inheritance. Do you see this? So you have this little nugget. And there it is. Moving on. I don't have time. I'm going in hyper mode now. John chapter 4, verse 7 through 9. You remember the Micro Machines commercials back in the day? They came over from there as well. Okay, that was too fast. John chapter 4, verse 7 through 9. There came a woman of Samaria to draw water. She came to draw water. She just didn't know which water she was going to get. Jesus said to her, give me a drink. Oh, what you need to know here. It is actually a teaching, a Jewish teaching, that if 
a, anybody uses, especially a man, uses the vessel of a Samaritan woman to drink from, he is classified as ceremonially unclean. They viewed, and I apologize, but this is just part of the culture, they viewed Samaritan woman as if they were culturally unclean all the time. So if you were to touch them, if you were to drink from their vessel, you by default would be ceremonially unclean, which means that the rabbi would not be able to function until he went through the process of being cleansed by that teaching. This is what Jesus knew, though. It was a load of bunk. And so he didn't care. But you can kind of understand a little bit of when his disciples showed up and saw him talking to a Samaritan woman. They were like, what are you doing? Because she could make you unfit to be able to do what you're called to do. He's like, mm, you don't get it. You will get it, but you don't get it yet. So he said to her, give me a drink. For his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. Whew, lunchtime. I shouldn't have said it. We're close. <laughs> Therefore, the Samaritan woman said to him, how is it that you being a Jew... Ask me for a drink since I am a Samaritan woman. There's a little flippancy in her voice because she views Jews as if they feel that they are superior to them and therefore she's going to lay it on thick. But culturally looking back, you can see where she's coming from, right? So how can you say to me that I'm uh, being a Jew, that I'm going to give you a drink since I'm a Samaritan woman? And it even says, for Jews have no dealings with Samaritans because the Samaritans view them as they're arrogant because Jews don't talk to Samaritans. So I want you to take the picture here. Jesus chose not to take the common route, which is going around Samaria. He chose to go through Samaria. Then he chose to talk to a woman by himself, which is a massive cultural no-no. Not only did he talk to a woman by himself as a rabbi, but he talked to a Samaritan woman by himself as a rabbi. Not only did he talk to her as a rabbi, but he asked her to give him a drink which would have culturally defiled him. Why am I saying this? Because Jesus' love knows no bound in chasing down those that are separated. And the, the judgments that we lay towards people that say you are unqualified to come into the kingdom are completely inappropriate when it comes to the dealings of Jesus in looking at people. Because the last time I checked, if you have a face and it is human, you can be saved. And so he shows up at the well, starts talking to this woman, <laughs> starts ministering to her and I gotta love it because he doesn't care he's just like give me a drink she's like jerk read between the lines message version that's right that's right she's like why are you asking me for a drink man get your own drink why did you come to the well and you don't have a vessel <laughs> stupid Read on and fast before I get myself in trouble. John 4, 10 through 12. Jesus answered and said to her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is who says to you, Give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. So the question on give me a drink wasn't really about getting a drink. It was about giving a drink himself. He just wanted to start a conversation with somebody. I would have given you a living water. She said to him, Sir, you have nothing to draw with and the well is deep. Where then do you get this living water you're talking about? And listen, it doesn't say are you not. It says you are not greater than our father Jacob, are you, who gave us the well and drank of it himself and his sons and his cattle? I think the question was meant to imply you're not greater than our father Jacob. I don't think it's necessarily asking the question to try to find an end. I think it's a backhanded question, if that makes sense. Like, what's your deal, man? 
Why are you asking this? She's being flippant, if you will. For instance, when she says to him, you're not greater than our father, whose father is she implying Jacob belongs to? The Samaritans, not the Jews. The Samaritans. He's our father, meaning that the Samaritans were the true and rightful ancestors of Israel and Jews had it wrong, right? The tense of her question in the Greek is negative. Her question was meant to imply that he wasn't greater than Jacob. It was a backhanded slap. John 4, 13 through 16, Jesus answered and said to her, everyone who drinks of this water will thirst again, but whoever drinks of the water that I will give him shall never thirst, but the water that I will give him will become in him a well of water springing up to eternal life. And the woman said to him, now she's intrigued, what's this guy talking about? Sir, give me this living water so that I I do not have to be thirsty, nor come all the way down here to draw water for myself. Her motivation in finding out is really for her own personal wants. How many of you have ever been like somebody rings the doorbell and you go, I don't want to get up and answer it? Right? But knowing that it might be a delivery from UPS, (laughs) you will get up and you will go to the door and answer it and inconvenience yourself. She's sitting here saying, please don't make me where I have to draw water anymore. I don't want to have to do this anymore, so show me where it is. And this is what Jesus says to her. She asked a very pointed question, show me where the living water is, and he says this, go call your husband and come here. Dum, dum, dum. I find it funny that the answer that she gives to him in this, she says, I have no husband. It is the shortest reply that she gives out of all of the different replies that are given because this is the one that she doesn't want to talk about. She's okay with being flippant with him, having a little bit of fun with him, and if he's going to give her something that's going to benefit her, okay, we'll go with that. And then he touched the red button. Go call your husband. I didn't talk about my husband. I, where'd the living water go? I wanted the living water. No, go call your husband and come. Jesus isn't saying this to try to hurt her. He's saying this because he's starting to deal with the wounds that she has. There's a purpose of why she showed up that day. We have a cultural wound that goes back 175 years, but also understand, or no, 722 years for her, but also understand this. We're about to find out that this woman has been married five times and the dude that she shocked up with now she's not married to. You want to talk about hurt? See, women couldn't survive in that day and age for their, the way that it worked is that a woman would marry a man, a man would be the breadwinner. If she did not have a husband, she was on the street and maybe working a profession she didn't want to. And so one husband, we don't know, passed away, divorced. I assume that not all five passed away or else we're, we're going to have to start talking about some arsenic and lace <laughs> and figuring out what's going on there, but... One husband, gone. Second husband, rejected. Third husband, gone. Fourth, gone. Fifth, gone. And the sixth that she's with wouldn't even legitimize their relationship by marrying her. That's an incredible level of pain that she has been walking through. And it's all from one source, men. And Jesus shows up as a but not just a man, but a Jew, and not just a Jew, a rabbi, and starts talking to her. And then he presses her button. I have no husband. Read between the lines. Stop talking. I don't want to hear about this anymore. I think we're done. So Jesus goes on, answers her. Call your husband. I have no husband. Jesus said to her, if you, you have answered correctly, that you're saying, I have no husband. For you have had five husbands, and the one you now have is not your husband. This you have said truly. When we read that, often so many times I've heard that read with judgment against the woman, saying, what a harlot, what a whatever, fill in the blank on that. The reality is this woman is trying to survive. 
And she went from husband to husband to husband to husband to husband, and then she lived with a man so that she didn't have to live on the street prostituting herself. And when Jesus is saying that, it really reveals more about us, the means by which we read that scripture, because if we read it with judgment, we better start examining our own hearts. Because Jesus is there to save her. And so he says, you've said right. And then the most redundant statement that has ever come to Scripture. Sir, I see that you are a prophet. (laughs) Really? Really? (laughs) Just read your mail, told you where you live kind of thing? Sir, I see that you are a prophet. To which Jesus replied, no, duh. No, he didn't say that. He didn't say that. That's, the, that's Jeff Dunleavy 1 verse 1. That's not, not in there. <laughs> You've answered correctly. He said, I perceive that you are a prophet. Listen to this. Now that she perceives that he is a prophet, when he started to deal with one hurt, all of a sudden another hurt manifests itself. You have five husbands. Go call the one you don't. You, you've said right. You have, listen to what she says. I, pre, I perceive that you are a prophet. And in the midst of the opportunity, because Jesus is there to love her, but the principle is this, hurt people hurt. And if we take an offense at hurt people hurting us, how can we bring them into healing? And so she instantly comes out with the sword towards Jesus when he starts dealing with her pain. And this is what she brings up. Our fathers worshipped on this mountain, being Mount Gerizim, and you people, whenever you start with you people, you're coming in with offense. You people say that in Jerusalem is the place where men ought to worship. In other words... I'm upset with you, and I'm about to pick a fight. And in her pain, when he touches her pain, a greater pain that is historical comes up into the moment and is about to rob her of the opportunity to come into salvation and knowing God with restored relationship. If Jesus takes the bait... We need to learn not to take the bait. When people say, oh, you don't have a right to say that about me, why are you believing it as if it's true? Let them say whatever the flip they want to say. That's their... You're not there to prove a point and win an argument. You're there for their eternal soul. Make it a higher priority. Get over a fence and live in love. So this is Jesus' response. Now listen, he also calls out truth, and I love this. He's so awesome. Jesus said to her, woman. No, he didn't say it like that. He didn't say it. Jesus said to her, woman, believe me, an hour is coming. We're neither in this mountain nor in Jerusalem. Will you worship the Father? You worship. He calls out truth because she has implied over and over again that Jewish people are wrong and Samaritans are superior. He calls out truth. He says, you worship what you do not know. We worship what we know for salvation is from the Jews, not the Samaritans, which is true. He has a right to say this because he is the agent of salvation and he's Jewish. He says, but an hour is coming and now is when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For such people, the Father seeks to be his worshipers. God is spirit and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. And what did he do there? He just broke down the massive division that they had over 722 years where she's trying to pick a fight and say, we worship on Gerizim, you worship in Jerusalem, we think we're right, we know you're wrong, Let's duke it out. And he says, no, both of those are going to be eliminated. And all of us that come into the kingdom are going to worship God in spirit and in truth. And my argument is gone. Do you see the brilliance in what he's doing? And he's speaking truth to her. He's not not pacifying and placating. He's speaking truth to her, but he's doing it motivated in love, not taking the bait of offense. And as a result... 
She recognizes that he is Messiah. And this is one of the things that I love. Because she says, I know the Messiah is going to come. And he says to her, I am he. Other people, son of man, other people kind of coded where he doesn't necessarily directly come out and say, but when he's talking to this woman, this woman who is a Samaritan who's been married five times and is shacked up with a dude and talking to her alone, he tells her directly, I'm the Messiah. You're right. Why? It's a great question. Why would he say that? Could it be that when you're dealing with that level of offense breaking down, the level of a relation has to be a little more clear? Could it be that with this woman, he knew the reason that he took the path, understand, the reason that he took the path to Samaria was to meet with this woman. That was the motive. And when they're at the end of the road, and she's saying, are you the Messiah? He just goes, yeah. Why? Because in her situation, he wanted her to know beyond a shadow of a doubt, I am here to save you. I'm not here to judge you. And so this woman that everybody knows runs back to her city and says, hey, come and see the man that told me everything about myself. I think we found the Messiah. And the whole city that knows her by her reputation, which is not good, pick up and run because if this woman can find the Messiah, dang, all of us should be able to find him as well. Do you see this? All of that could only take place if he did not take the bait of offense. And he made it his heart priority to break down her defenses through her offense in order to plow through so that he could take away her level of judgment towards him. Do you see this? Go and do likewise. Do the same. Stand with me if you would. I apologize if I was a little long, but quite frankly, I thought it was pretty good. <laughs> Thank you, Kenny Proxy. Appreciate that so very much. <laughs> Y'all, we need to deal with a critical spirit. We need to deal because the reality is, just to be straight with you, the enemy knows where our weaknesses are. And he likes to poke at them. And if we know that we have, where we value people's opinions as if they are truth, or we value people's opinions above what God has to say to us, when we are in that moment, the enemy can use that person as a tool to push that button in you to try to elicit a response that will bring up offense in you, which will then bring a separation between the person you're trying to minister to. We cannot allow that to take place. Can I get an amen?